Ask people who Jesus is, and you will discover a wide variety of answers. Journey with us to the Gospel of Mark as we discover the authentic Jesus. Who do you say Jesus is? We're in this series going through Mark as we prepare for Resurrection Sunday, or what was typically called Easter. I uh, just felt it impressed upon my heart that we might uh, just focus on Christ and get um, the magnitude of who He is. And today we're talking about His power. My first experience with power was with the family car. Let me explain. Uh, the first car that I remember us traveling in as a family uh, when I was old enough was uh, uh, Ozenville Delta 88. Can I get a witness? Anybody here? Yeah? Had the 455 rocket engine, and an air cleaner had a rocket on it, and i never forget it. And I was like, that is so cool. You know, you got these, like, wimpy engines, like a 3.2 or an, a 1.8 I see on these cars today. Like, I don't, is that really a car? I think that's more of a sewing machine that carries people or something. But anyway, uh, this had a real engine. And then we had, um, then we had a Buick Electra 225. My dad liked the big boats, right? You could take the hood off and go sledding. Like the whole family could go sledding on the hood. And it had a, I think it had a, it had a four something in it. 400 maybe. But then we got, then he got the 71 Cadillac and it had a 501 big block. And that's what the car I learned to drive on, right? It was awesome. I mean, you could just squall the tires on thing. It was so much fun, but I never did that. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so power, power, those cars had power, but the real power of the family car was not under the hood. It was the man behind the steering wheel because, uh, back before there were third row seats, there were bench seats. Remember, remember the bench seats. And so you could get three in the front and four in the back. And so when we would go see grandpa and grandma who lived in Illinois, and at that time we were living in Southern Pennsylvania, it was about 750 miles uh, traveling, and we all got in the car, and dad would, you know, sit on the trunk to get it latched, all the luggage in the back, right? Remember those days, you know? And, 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 and when it would pop open, it would fly open. Remember that? All right? Some of y'all are relating, some of y'all aren't. But anyway... Uh, as that trip would go on, uh, the power behind the steering wheel would often say something like this when he was in a good mood. He would say, we're going to play the quiet game now. <laughs> Remember the quiet game? Some of you are still playing it. And I always lost. I was the youngest and my brother would punch me until I would squeal or, or pinch me or whatever, you know, and I always lost and then I got in trouble. Uh, but uh, I got him back. Uh, anyway, uh, then if dad was uh, short, if he was tired and, uh, and we were loud, he said one word, silence. <laughs> it was usually louder than that. There was a hand movement involved. <laughs> It was uh, the hand of God coming back over to reach whatever he could grab and control it. Uh, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is like with one word, the authority in my dad's voice would bring complete control into that rowdy crowd in the back. And I, I'll never forget it. Um, now, some of us, uh, is the storms that we face are not kids loud in the back seat. The storms, the problems that we face are, are far more difficult than that. Um, your storm may be something like uh, violent fits of anger taking place in your family. Maybe it's from within yourself or it could be a sudden storm of depression. It could be the menacing evil of addiction uh, just raging within your family or in your own life. It, you may feel like you're drowning, caring for an aging parent. You might feel totally suffocated, caring for a special needs child. Uh, there's, these are storms, you know, like trying to keep your family together, trying to keep your mind together. This week, it has been impressed upon me that many people in our congregation are dealing with a lot of suffering. There's a lot of people going through some really difficult times. Uh, cancer, death, um, illnesses of all kinds, uh, financial problems, relationship problems. And so my heart today is to bring to you a message that will encourage you about the power of Christ that is available to us because we are His 
followers. And so I'm not here to tell you something you've never heard before, just to remind you about what you already know. And so um, maybe the storm in your life has come very suddenly, like a job termination, or maybe it's, it's like the rains that we've had. When it rains, it pours like it's just been one problem after another, and they just mount, and you feel like you're drowning. And so um, when these things happen, we are asking ourselves, can I trust Jesus to calm my storm? Because I know there's two, there's two, usually in church, there's two crowds. There's the people that are first coming to realize this. And then there's people who know it, but they, for, they still think it's all up to them. Uh, you know, and, and I think I'm that guy a lot of times. Within my own resources and my own abilities, I'm trying to fix the problems that are around me. And so, uh, if your confidence is not in Jesus, let's talk about the first crowd. If your confidence is not in Jesus, then it's your own abilities and resources that have to bring a calm to the storm, that have to bring some resolution to the problem. But that's not going to work for everything, is it? Because there are certain things that happen in our life that are just simply way beyond our control. That other group of people in here, you people who've been following Jesus for a while, maybe since you were a child, you need to be reminded that God is able. You need to be convinced of it. And you need to tap into the power that's available to us. Because Jesus says, we have not because we ask not. Right? And so uh, we're looking in Mark chapter 4 today. And that part of the gospel of Mark begins uh, a significant turning point in his storytelling of the life of Jesus. Where he begins to demonstrate uh, in the miracles that that, that Jesus does God's power uh, found in Christ. And so the three greatest life-threatening forces in ancient cultures were natural disasters, demonic possession, and death. Mark places together three scenes from Jesus' life to show his power over these great enemies, the calming of the storm, the exorcism of legion, and the raising of Jairus' daughter from, the de- from death. Mark intends these back-to-back scenes to prove that Jesus has sovereign power over the worst kinds of evil that we could possibly experience. The point Mark is trying to make clear is Jesus has power over nature, demons, and death. And those three broad categories is what we face the most terrifying types of experiences in our life. A fallen nature, our failing health, someone we love's failing health, or uh, the natural disasters that occur like the one that's taken place out in Nebraska in the Midwest, you know, just devastation or the big storms, you know. That we live in a fallen world and that's why these things take place and God did not intend it that way, but they take place. And then there's that other category of demonic uh, oppression, and that comes through uh, things like depression and addiction and uh, doctrines of demons teaching people that God doesn't exist or that they're God or something else. And then there's that big one, death, that everyone faces. The two things that every American faces is death and death. Yeah, because it's just around the corner, right? Some of you are like, I'm trying to get it done. But anyway, the point is that, that these big battles come. And so we have an eye... Now listen, we have an eyewitness account of an individual that controls nature, that overcomes death, and tells the demons, jump into the pigs, right? When pigs fly. And so that was a, we're not going to get to there, but that's a great story. So Mark chapter 4, verse 35 That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. So Jesus and an entourage of boats are going from the Jewish side of Galilee, that's the west side, to the east side of Galilee, that's the uh, Gentile side, that's where he's going to run into the, 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 the demon-possessed man uh, in the tombs who's got broken chains running naked. Wouldn't that be crazy? Uh, but anyway, he's, they're, they're, they're going, they're, that's the side of the sea that they're, they're going over, and it's an eight-mile journey. Now, we don't know exactly how long they're in the boat, but it's a considerable uh, sail or row 
towing, uh, you know, ride over to the other side. And somewhere across this journey, there's a great storm that comes about. A furious squall came up, Mark says. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Right? Now remember, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew are fishermen. They grew up around this lake. They, they, they know how to read the signs of the sky and what the day is going to be like. They understand the shoreline. They know the currents in, the, in those waters. And, and they, they understand what's going on. And the storm comes up so quickly and so violently that these experienced men feel like they're going to die. So these aren't just amateurs out there. And, and so they found themselves in a situation that was beyond their ability to control. Are you tracking with me here? Uh, he got up. He rebuked the wind and, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified now. They were scared at the storm. Now they're terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is God's word. And this is what we're going to try to unpack today and apply to our lives. So the Sea of Galilee six, sits 682 feet below sea level. Now, uh, just a few miles, about 32 miles uh, to the north is Mount Hermon. And it sits 290 feet high. So you have this really low sea in a very hot area. And then the cool mountain just not too far away. So there's this big contrast. And so um, the cold air from those mountains continually clashes with the warm air coming up from the Sea of Galilee. And results in these terrible, dangerous storms. And so this storm is so impressive that they, they, these guys feel like they're going to die. And, and, and so they wake Jesus up, and Jesus says with these authoritative words, Quiet, be still. And the storm ends, and the water is crystal flat. Clear. That's what the, the, the author in, in the original language, it's, it's telling us that the waters don't just become, you know, sort of like calm. No, they're completely calm. It's a sea of glass. Now, if you've ever been out on a boat on a rough lake, windy day fishing, or maybe you've been on a cruise. A friend of mine recently got off a cruise, and they were trying to get back to port, but the hurricane was sitting right off the coast of North Carolina, and everybody was sick, and as the storm died down, the waves are still rolling. And so, so what we're seeing right here is that there's this massive, terrifying storm that ends completely at a moment. Everything's calm. It's, it's like it never happened. This isn't just like, it just kind of died away. No, it, it stopped like a compliant child crying. Like it just, boom, that's it. And so, um, uh, you, you have to understand that Jesus has real power to do what we cannot do. Our, last year at VBS, there were these terrible storms all over Chatham. The sky was kind of green in tent. You know, it was really like, you, th you thought maybe a, a tornado was going to come and, and really black clouds. And we were getting calls from Main Street saying, hey, you need to get the kids in. I mean, and so we just started praying. And the storms went all the way around us. We didn't get wet at all. And I was like, this is sweet. I, and, and I attribute that to prayer. I mean, a lot of times, oh, that was just coincidence. I think we attribute a lot of things to coincidence that's God's fingerprints on the situation. He loves us that much. He knows the hairs in your head. And some of you, that's an easy count for him. But, but anyway, uh, I won't mention any names, uh, Bill Randolph. But, but anyway, uh, <laughs> the, details, the details in this account are important. They're very important because when it says Jesus is asleep on a cushion in the stern, uh, that's, a, that, that's the, the marks of an eyewitness account. And so Bible scholar Vincent Taylor says that these type of details are so unnecessary uh, to the story that they, they mark the story as a genuine reminiscent. So, so, so here's what I'm trying to say. Don't let anyone and don't let your own reason, your own human reasoning take away from the magnitude of Jesus' power displayed in this moment. This is a terrible squall that ends in an instant. 
Everything changes in a second. As soon as he speaks, everything changes. And so in real time, with real power, Jesus calms that storm. And he can for our lives too. In an instant. On a dime. In a moment. If we understand who he is and have faith in what he can do and ask him. And so some of the storms in our life are very physical and we need a physical solution. And God is about that as much as he is a spiritual. God often wins us to his understanding and his side by letting us witness miracles. And he's God and we're not. There's a story about a Danish king, uh, Canute, and he was, uh, had a bunch of courtiers in his, uh, in, in his kingdom hall, and they were, you know, lauding him as almost divine, and he got fed up with it. So he marches them out, uh, he takes them down to the shore outside his castle, and as the waves are rolling up on the shore, he looks at the waves and says, stop! And they keep rolling in. And then he turns to his court and he says, am I divine? And here's the point. Like this king understood he was not God. But he recognized what God could do. And so uh, we, uh, we have to understand that our faith is in a God that can do the impossible. And he does it off and it's recorded in an eyewitness so that we don't forget it. Uh, and so, so our, in, in the book of Job, we read, uh, God say to Job, This far and no farther will you come, talking to the waves. Here you proud waves must stop. The ancients knew this. The disciples learned this. Jesus demonstrated this, that God can control nature in an instant. And so who or what is your faith in? You may believe that you are here by accident, accidental forces of nature. And you, when you face the storms in your life, you must save yourself. Or you can believe in the eyewitness account that Jesus presented himself as Lord over any and every storm, I might add. And you will have what you need when you need it. You have two choices. There's two groups of people in this world. Those who follow Christ and those who don't. Those are the categories. And those who follow Christ need to recognize that God is able to do the impossible. And those who don't follow Christ, it's all up to you to figure it out. You figure it out. You take care of it. And so these are the options. And so imagine you're falling off a cliff. And sticking out of the side of that cliff as you fall is a branch. You don't know how strong it is. As you fall, you have just enough time to grab that branch. How much faith do you have to have in the branch? Must you be totally sure it can save you? No. You only have to have enough faith to grab the branch. Here's the point. It's not, it's not the quality of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. You might have just a little faith. I believe there's God. That's enough. He can work with that. It, it's, it, so our performance and our faith is not what saves us. It's the object of our faith that saves us. And so Jesus is the only one who has the power to save. Now he not only has real power, he has infinite power. And so here's a, a picture of the largest son that we know of. Canis Majoris. Now, the, 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 the little inset picture there is our sun in comparison to that. Uh, the sun of our solar system. So 9.3 billion of our suns would fit into that sun of Canis Majoris. Is that not incredible? That's incredible. Now, here's another picture. This is our sun in comparison to our earth. You can barely see that uh, little earth right there, right? Now... 3 quadrillion 729 trillion earths fill in, fit into Canis Majoris. Are you getting the scope, the size of our solar system or, or of the universe that we, that we exist in? Now, all of these planets, these and all the others, come into existence because Jesus speaks them into existence. His power, at the present moment, keeps him spinning. That was the guy in the boat. 
If you're in the boat with Jesus, or if you want to say Jesus is in my boat, whatever, do you understand the power that is beside you and around you? Why are you afraid? Why do you doubt? Why do you wonder that it won't be worked out? God has all of this at His disposal. Infinite power. Sometimes we worship God wondering if He can fix it. And God's like, all right, I'll work with that faith. But He would much rather for us to walk boldly up to Him and say, God, I know you're going to fix this. I don't know how it's going to be fixed. You're going to bring good out of it. But you got this. And we don't need to be worried and taking stomach pills and can't sleep at night, even though those things happen to me too. What we have to realize is that God is more than able to bring good out of bad, even the worst of circumstances. Jesus has infinite power. And we can count on Him, especially when we're afraid. You know, when the disciples say, Jesus... <laughs> and I shouldn't be make fun of them because I'd have done the same thing. You know, I was like, "Aren't you, aren't you concerned we're gonna drown? You know, aren't you, aren't you at least a bit terrified? You know, I mean, I mean, these fishermen said, "Don't you care?" And Jesus, you know, he he gets up and he and he performs this miracle, and it echoes this this situation echoes back to the Exodus because oftentimes we'll see a story, a format of a story. Told once, and then again, and then a third time. It's told differently each time, but the storyline is basically the same. There's this crisis way beyond the control of God's people. God steps in and fixes it. Now, <clears throat> why might you as a parent or a grandparent or a guardian or a teacher or a coach repeat something more than once? Because it takes a while for the people, the student, the child to get it, right? And so... There's this story about Israel, about three million people coming out of Egypt. And uh, Pharaoh says, I don't want to let them go. So he sends his army after him. And when the Egyptians were overtaking them, we read in Exodus 14.10, they cried out to the Lord and said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians will see the day, uh, the, the Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord Himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I mean, this story is, this is the driving narrative of the Old Testament. If there's one story you want to examine over and over again, it's the exodus of the Israelites into the promised land. It is the primary driving story. And what, there's so many lessons to be learned. And what we see here is a new Israel being established, a new kingdom. Jesus is the new Moses. He's the new leader. And, and, and here we have again God's people. These, these disciples have already witnessed Jesus do miracles. And they're terrified in the storm. Have you committed your life to Christ and found yourself in a situation where you're very terrified? Even after you said yes to Jesus? Of course. We all have. That's the point of preaching. It's to remind us and renew our commitment to what we already know. And so when you're sinking, it feels like God's sleeping. And we say things like this. If God, ca if God cared about me, He wouldn't let me go through this. We've all felt that way. I mean, if you haven't felt this way, you're not telling the truth because we've all felt this way. And so, uh, what, what we have to understand is that, that we have to change the stinking thinking. And, and, and we need to say this. God cares for me and He will walk with me through this. He has the power. He, he, he is intimately involved in our lives. And so this is why we have God put on flesh and bone and sit in a boat. So that, so we, we don't have this like, this, this sort of a esoteric, misty cloud of understanding of God. No, we've got flesh and bone. We have God say, storm stop, stops. Right there, right there. And, and so that's what we need to know. And so accessing the power of God comes through four primary ways. 
And if you want to see the power of God work in your life and work in your problems and work in the situations of the people around you, you need to do these things. You need to read your Bible. You need to be reminded about what God can do. And the Holy Spirit is yelling at us. Somebody, say, somebody might say, I, God doesn't speak to me. Well, he, every time you open up the Bible, he's screaming at you. All right? He's yelling perfect will into your life. And, and, and then the next thing we need to do is have fellowship with believers. Nothing is more encouraging than coming together and being reminded about what God has done in someone else's life. Hearing the testimony of God's power in another person's life. And then we need to fast. Stop eating for a period of time and devote that time to prayer. I was talking with one of our elders this week and if you add up the amount of time we think about food, prepare food, go to Food Line and get food or wherever you shop, right? And then fix the food and then clean up after the food, you've got some time to pray, right? One reason the church is so weak in America is we don't fast and we don't pray. So start fasting and praying. Uh, here's, here's, one, here's one idea. Uh, every day you can pray, you can fast for 12 hours, so when you have dinner at 7 p.m. in the evening, if that's when you eat, if your schedule works out that way, then don't eat again until 7 a.m. There's a 12-hour fast every day. And so when you go to bed at night, before you go to bed, get on your knees and pray to the Lord and ask Him for deliverance in whatever you're facing. Then I recommend taking one day a week and having a time of maybe skipping one meal, a lunchtime, a breakfast time, an evening time, and devote that time to prayer. You will be amazed at what God will do if you will show yourself sincere that He has the power to do amazing things. That's what He's looking for. He's looking for people who will devote themselves to prayer and fasting. So that's what Jesus did. And look what Jesus accomplished. And then lastly, uh, prayer, I've already included that. But, um, you know, I use the acronym PUSH for about prayer. PUSH, pray until something happens, right? Prayer, you know, PUSH, so pray until something happens. God is able to do amazing things. And we have witnessed in this congregation, God walk with men battling prostate cancer, single moms recovering from divorce, Teenagers fighting their way through depression and coming to healing. Walking with, uh, we see God walk with children, uh, overcoming life-threatening diseases. We see God walk with people, overcoming addiction. Uh, Jesus is wide awake to our problems and our situation. And the reason that Jesus was sleeping is because he had humanity uh, all over him and he gets tired just like us. But he is now separate and He is in heaven, and He is attuned to what is going on in our life. And so when we do these things, when we read, when we fellowship, when we worship, when we pray, we are demonstrating our confidence in God's ability to take care of our storms. The only safe place is in God's will. That's the only place you're safe, is in God's will. God asked them, why are you so afraid? <laughs> Can you imagine what they're thinking? Jesus was sinking. And, 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 and Jesus was like, look, even if we die, I got this. Like, I got this. But, of course, that doesn't happen. And so, the Bible is packed with stories of people who suffer betrayal and persecution and all kinds of, of difficulties. And yet, God always follows up with these miraculous events. And, and so, we should be encouraged. And so, God wastes no pain. He wastes no storms. All of it, 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 it has something to do with teaching us. Elizabeth Elliot tells a story of one time she was in Scotland and she was watching a shepherd uh, take, her, take, take his sheep and drop them in this huge vat of insecticide. And uh, the sheep is bleeding, you know, picking them up and then just practically drowning them in this big vat of insecticide. And, and they come up and they hate it, you know, and, and off they go. And so she begins to ask the shepherd, why are you doing this? And the reason uh, that was explained to her is that the insects are so bad that they, they can not only uh, make the sheep so sick, but they can actually kill it from the bites. And so sometimes when it feels like we're drowning, God is preparing us for something more difficult. And we're like, no, 
no, I can't go through this financial crisis. I can't go through this relationship struggle. I can't go through seeing this person suffer. And, and like we're, we're like the sheep. We're drowning in this vat of incest, uh, 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 what, what's that stuff? insecticide. That's it. And, and pesticide. I, I came up with a new word today. But, but anyway, the point is like when, we're, when, we're, when we feel like we're drowning, God is doing something in that storm for us or through us or to us or it may be benefiting someone else. But, but anyway, um, it's so important. Hebrew writer says that God will never leave you and never abandon you. You might feel that way, but the truth of the matter is He is right by our side. Now, <clears throat> the only safe place is to be in God's will. But God himself is not safe. By that I mean, God wields a power that in our human understanding looks very dangerous. And the best presentation of that is what happens to Jesus. So, Jesus is spared in the storm. I mean, Jesus spares the disciples in the storm. But Jesus himself is not. And so it's amazing for us to understand. It says the disciples were absolutely terrified. And they said, who is this man? They didn't understand this was the God man. They said, even the winds and the waves obey him. They're amazed at his power. And what Mark has deliberately done. And this is so cool. Because many of you went through the Jonah series. What Mark has deliberately done is he's contrasted this episode in Jesus' life and used words that are exactly the same as found in the first chapter of the book of Jonah. So, uh, there's this parallel that's going on. Both Jesus and Jonah were in the boat. Both are overtaken by a storm. Both Jesus and Jonah were asleep in the boat. And both stories, the sailors woke up the sleeper and said, we're going to die. In both, the sea was miraculously calmed. And in both, the sailors became more terrified than they were before it was calmed. Right? I mean, do you remember that in Jonah? They throw Jonah in and the, and the, and the, and the sea becomes like, a, like, like from waves to glass. And, they're, and then they're terrified and they're like... Jonah's God. That's God. Not the little demigods we have lying around, right? Uh, Jonah is, is, is thrown into the fish, right? That swims into the bottom of the earth for three days. Jesus is put into a tomb for three days. But there's one glaring difference in these two stories. There's one greater than Jonah in this story. And this, this man, Jesus, dies. Jonah doesn't die. But Jesus does die. He's thrown into the bell of the earth. But then he's resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. To show that there is no power greater than God's power, even death. So, here's the point. Today, as we come to this moment of inviting you, here's what I want you to think about. I want to invite you to come forward or make a decision where you're standing. That, that God has the ability... To deal with whatever you're going through. And maybe what you need to do is tap into God's power through those steps that I mentioned earlier. Whether it be reading or prayer or fasting or fellowship, right? Um, the winds and the waves obey Jesus' name. And the only thing that limits God's power in our life is our lack of asking for His help. That's what limits it. It's, uh, it's, it's available. And it's a miraculous. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this amazing story. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.